Hello, I am Victoria Rogers. I am community manager for Renegade Game Studios, and I am here with a very special person. Uh, we met, I think, briefly once at a convention last year. Um, but this is Noxweiler Burf, who is terrain builder, hobbyist, mini painter, all sorts of things, really. LARPer? Yeah, as an well. avid LARPer. I mean, anything that involves getting dressed up and going into the woods, I'm totally on board. 100%. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Victoria. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. You know, you are going to show me how to make a Zordon diorama, like a Zordon head. Yeah, so uh, we were discussing this a few months ago and we knew that the Morphin meet was coming up and we knew how absolutely ravenous the Power Ranger fans were and we were really excited about some of the stuff that was coming out for Heroes of the Grid. And so I kind of was given the option to do anything that I wanted to do and I kind of dug back into my memories of the Power Rangers, which I'm not gonna put a, put a date on it, but <laughs> it was a while ago. And uh, I always kind of came back to the amazing stuff with uh, with Zordon. I knew that that was a figure that didn't really exist in the existing uh, sets that Renegade puts out. And um, I thought that it would be amazing to kind of put together our own Zordon head here. Um, so this is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to make one of these yourself. Now there's some obvious differences that you could add on to it. You can do a whole lot of things on your, your own, but we'll go step by step through that. All right. So, okay, cool. So what, what is the first step for something yeah. like this? So if you, I know the, the way that I understand it, and I, I have been lurking around on the forums and I've, I've met some really amazing people in the community who are very actively engaged in the process of, you know, the, engaging with the hobby part of this uh, game. And you do have, I'm gonna switch over to my overhead. Um, you do have some amazing uh, miniatures. They are very able to be easily kind of painted here. Um, and you've got so much that you could do with them. The scaling is interesting to me because it's large enough for an introductory uh, painter to really get in there and do some great work right off the bat without being intimidated by like a 32 millimeter or a 28 millimeter model. So uh, the, the, the shapes and all of the forms that these great miniatures have, have really kind of opened things up. So what I was thinking about was like, how would you scale that to what Zordon actually would, would stand at if you were trying to compare those two things? And so I, I, I made some measurements. You can do this any way that you want. Um, I believe that we have a graphic. I'm gonna switch back to my face cam here. But I believe that you have a graphic that you're going to see here in just a moment that's going to show you the equipment and the materials that you're going to need. Um, and and it's fairly straightforward. And there's a lot of space for you to um, get creative and to, um, you know, substitute items that are more uh, available to you. So, so maybe you can't find a specific type of foam, but that, you know, cardboard could work. There are plenty of places where you can get foam uh, board. So if you're looking for something like that, any kind of craft store is going to be able to help you. But to, to answer your question, Victoria, really the first um, the first thing that you're going to need to do is gather these basic materials. Mm -hmm. And then once you have them, we're going to start to prepare them for the actual build, which is uh, not as complicated as it may seem. Uh, I promise you that while the result is impressive, the, the effort that you have to put in is not overly complicated. So I, I do feel like it's fairly accessible. Uh, if we could go to that graphic, I guess we could talk about materials, right? Yeah, we're looking at the graphic right now. And actually my question was, where did you find that mannequin head? Okay, so I have made this extremely easy for everyone. If you want, if you don't have a lot of these materials accessible to you, I've created an Amazon wish link. And the, if the link isn't available there, you can hit me up either on the Discord or on the Facebook page for Heroes of the Grid and I will make sure to get that to you. Uh, it is a full all-in-one shopping cart. So all you have to do is, is purchase those items. Um, you can pick and choose from those if there are things that you don't wanna use to kind of save some money. I am gonna give you a couple of options on how you could um, substitute certain items to either make a more complicated result or 
to take those items and, and reduce it so that it's a little more ex inexpensive if that's something that you're concerned with. Now, the build that I have in front of you, this, this version of the Zordon, was very inexpensive. I used perhaps 50, maybe $60 in material in total, which I know is not an inconsiderable amount of money, but considering the result, I think that it's well worth the effort. Um, mm -hmm. So really, you can go to Amazon um, or, and, and I'm a big fan of, of supporting local stores, especially these days. So if you go to most craft and hobby stores, they will have a version of this. Now you could sculpt on top of a Halloween mask you could also print out a paper version of Zordon's face and you could put that on the inside of the tube so that it's rolled into the interior and the result will be, you know, very good. However, uh, for me, I like the three dimensionality of this. I like to be able to uh, sculpt and I'm gonna, uh, in some of the videos that we're gonna show you here in a moment, um, I think you're gonna find that it's a lot of fun and, and it offers you an opportunity to be even more creative with the way that you kind of portray Zordon. Uh, so for me, the, the foam head was the way to go, but you're not strictly stuck on just doing it with the, the foam mannequin head. All right, that's, I love that. And I love the idea how there's the options with that, with the image on the wrapped around on the inside, honestly. I'm not much of a sculptor. I have tried so many times. Yeah, no, I mean, but try it is what counts. And you, and you get better as you do things, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So why don't you walk us through the first, the first part of your process? We've gathered our materials. We got what we got, like we got what we need. Now, how do we start? Because those materials don't look anything like what you've got there. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, that's the point. This is where we're going to be crafting this and putting things together. So the first few things that I did was I prepared each section. And um, the way that I did that was I, I kind of chose where the bases were. And I'm going to go to my overhead again, and I'm going to show you a few parts of this build, and we can kind of continue to talk about it here. So this on top is a very simple um, cottage cheese tub and on bottom on the bottom part it's the exact identical tub um, I'm not recommending that you eat like two gallons of cottage cheese to be able to complete this process but I, I certainly don't think you should let it go to waste um, you can you can change the containers you can find something else that works for you that's roughly about the same size uh, yeah if and, you're not into cottage cheese there are other options yeah, it's not an exclusive cottage cheese build. We are able to <laughs> deviate from that part of the process, thankfully. Um, so I was looking at these two base parts, right? And so this base piece here is made from a very simple piece of pink insulation foam. And you can find this at any hardware store. And they usually come in three by three sheets. And I know we've kind of gone through that material list already, but the great thing about this foam is, is that it is really the bread and butter of any sort of terrain building or hobby building uh, equipment. And so it cuts and it carves extremely easily. Uh, and as you grow as someone who does so much of this hobby work, you're gonna find that you keep coming back to material like this and that it also grows with you. Because while we're only gonna be cutting a few squares and a few triangles and a few little decorative piece, pieces out of this pink insulation foam, it is going to be able to do more for you as your skills grow. If you decide that you wanna carve, the great thing about this foam is that it does hold uh, very easily uh, the indentations, it holds uh, any sort of carving that you might do. So if I wanted to come into this piece of foam and start to really make things a little better than just a flat piece, and maybe I wanted to create some texture here, all I'm doing is putting the slightest amount of pressure onto this foam. And unlike the kind of foam that you'll find in packing material for, I don't know, like a VCR, <laughs> who has a VCR, right? <laughs> um, so if you have, uh, if you have some sort of packing material from a piece of electronics and you decide that you want to, uh, try to sculpt it, you can make that stuff work for you. The problem with it is, is that it, it's not as dense of a foam. 
And so you've got this really, really tight bundle of foam and it doesn't have the air pockets or it doesn't crumble in the same way. Here's a part that I cut earlier on. And as you can see, it has a nice thick interior that matches its exterior. So all the way through, we have very, very, very strong staple foam. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't crumble and turn into like little beads of- Of, of white. Yes. That sticks to everything. Yeah. Um, that is exactly what you want to try to avoid. Um, now, with the foam head that I cut, um, I do, uh, do I have it with me here? I don't have the extra foam head, but the foam head is made of that same material. And you'll notice as soon as you shave off the front of it that it does that. Um, we have a few clips here. So let's go to our first clip of video and I'll mm -hmm. show you kind of like how we've been starting this process and how some of these parts come together. Now, uh, so it's a, it's a really simple thing when we start out. Um, so don't be intimidated by the process. It looks like there's a lot going on here, but I promise you it really isn't that difficult. The, the, just make sure that if you're using hobby knives and other cutting implements that you're being safe. Um, we'll talk a little bit about safety when we come back from this clip, but as soon as that goes through, you'll kind of see how I started building out the base. Okay, so I, as you can see, I've made a couple of templates here. And those templates are going to be used in a couple of different areas. The, the foam uh, is going to be underneath a piece of this very thick, dense cardstock. Uh, this is another standard of the hobby um, terrain building community. It is a dense uh, backing board. It is the same sort of material that you'll find on the back of a, a pad of paper. And you could salvage any of those pieces. The great thing about this hobby is that anything that you find could potentially be reused and, and brought into your work somewhere. Um, it's a lot like making art out of trash. And it's really attractive to me because we live in a society that is so quick to kind of throw everything away and let it be in a landfill or, you know, dumped into our oceans or causing further problems. And with the, with the right eye, which is something that I think that you kind of learn as you go along, you're able to kind of see the potential of some of these materials. The, the backing board, however, we want to use because a corrugated cardboard has that interior piece that you'll often find um, that, it again, has air holes. It's not completely dense all the way through. And so it's harder to get a good clean edge. It's harder to have sharp, um, crisp uh, corners and other pieces. So the first thing that I did was I cut a piece of this and this um, this cardboard, this, this dense backing board is going to form the very top of the bottom pedestal for our, our tube, our Zordon tube. And we are going to take that, we're gonna, we're gonna glue it onto a piece of our foam once both are uh, prepared and properly sized out. Um, and then once that is done, we're gonna, we're, we're pretty much laminating so i'm going to go back to my overhead here so that i can show you kind of what i mean by that and so by laminating i kind of mean that we're taking a piece of a, a, a material it could be paper it could be cardboard it could be something else that has either a texture or a look that we want on a thicker piece of material or it could be multiple of the same piece of layer if you were going to build some of this with just cardboard you might take multiple pieces of cardboard and put glue on one side of each, stack them together and let it all dry so that you're forming a thicker, more durable piece. Um, here, we're using this to create a solid and reliable facing for the very top of the Zordon pedestal. Um, on the model itself, that equated to this portion here along on the corners. And so all the way around, we had a very solid piece and it was uh, a little more durable than just the foam itself. The thing about the foam is that whenever you're working with it, depending on the type of adhesives that you use, you could be in a situation where hot glue will melt the top of the foam or distort it or um, cause further issue. A lot of the glues that I've been using to do this are simple PVA glues or a wood glue. Um, again, items that you can find at any hardware store. 
Um, wood glue is particularly good for this because it can be watered down. Um, you can always create a thinner, uh, thinner coat that can then be used to uh, help to adhere these things, but still give you the coverage that you want without being too thick. Um, what kind of ratio of water to glue would you suggest? Uh, for this situation, and that's the great thing about a water-based uh, glue, is that you're able to kind of use it depending on what the technique that you're using it for. Uh, it, it, it can alter. For this, I use about 25% water to 75% uh, glue. So okay. uh, it's, a, it's, it's enough to thin it down so that it smoothly applies to the entire piece. Um, again, I want it to be thick enough to make a, a really strong bond, but I also use a lot of the same glues, Victoria, to create a surface uh, wash and I let that dry. The reason that you would do that is because you can protect your glue uh, in, a, in a coat of that. It's going to be harder so that it won't dent as easily. You know, we were doing this with our tool earlier and you could press that down. I'm going to switch back to us here. Uh, so when you're using this, it can be uh, dented very easily. But if you put a good couple of coats of glue over it, it will 100 percent create a strong lasting bond that you can then uh, paint on top of. So if you've ever put a piece of foam out and you've, you've made something out of it and you're like, okay, I'm going to paint it really quick. I'm just going to go get some spray paint and just coat it with a coat of spray paint. What you will have discovered is that the, the accelerants, uh, all of the aerosols in the, in the spray eat the foam. Mm -hmm. So it causes it to pit and turn into cottage cheese and Swiss cheese. And it just puts a bunch of holes in it. It ruins the form of whatever you've painted. And, in doing that, you want to you, you can avoid it by creating a new uh, surface over the top of that. And that's kind of where the glue can then be used to coat over the entire thing. We're not quite there yet with our build. So let's let's move along our list and I'll continue to talk to you a little bit about what we've done. Uh, Victoria, do you or, or does anybody in chat right now have any questions that might help us? Um, no, uh, the, we have one question that's just saying how much tweaking to make this into a dice tower. <laughs> that's a great idea. Um, I would say that if you wanted to turn this into a dice tower, uh, I would probably put it along the back. If you, if you look at old images of, uh, especially the, like the 1990s Zordon stuff, there are these tubes on either side. Um, I would build a bigger platform and then use the clear tubes as the dice tubes and maybe have two of them. And mm -hmm. then you can make little trays. And then right here on the Zordon, um, you could uh, you could you could just run those tubes right here and right here, and even get another light here. Um, we haven't quite gotten to the point where I've talked about the LEDs, but this is meant to light up. And we've already got a battery-operated light installed in here. And I'll, I'll, I'll move through that a little bit further so that okay. we can kind of talk about how that happens. Um, but yeah, uh, should I should I move on, Victoria? Yeah, I think so. I think we're moving at a good pace, and we're good uh, for time. We're at the twenty three minute mark, so let's uh, let's move on to the next state step. Okay, yeah, let's let's do that, Victoria. Let's let's go ahead. I'm going to show you. Um, th there's a couple of ways to do this. But before we start the next clip, I want to talk about tool safety. Um, it's very important that when you're working with these materials that you're using um, sharp knives. I, I know it sounds a little uh, counterintuitive. Oh, I apologize. I don't know where I, that isn't silence. Somebody sending me a raven. <laughs> All right. Um, so the when you're using, it sounds counterintuitive, right? Um, you want the sharpest blade that you can find. And I use these. Uh, carpet knives. There, you can find these at craft stores as well. They come in a variety of sizes, and it is always a good idea to get disposable blades that have perhaps interchangeable uh, refills. Because I, I, the mistake that I find that most hobbyists immediately undertake when when they're when they're starting their their work is that they try to get too much out of their blades and all of the materials that they're using. And the reason that that is dangerous is that and I'm going to switch over here to show you my overhead again. Um, 
So, oh, we've got a frozen, uh, we've got a frozen overhead. So let me switch over to this. Uh, okay, so if I run this right here, right, it moves pretty smoothly through the material. And rather than trying to dig your, your, your blade down and cut all the way through in one swipe, it is much better to very slowly and very patiently cutting away from yourself. I, my body is this way. So when I'm doing like this, if I were to hit something and move, I would not be pulling this blade into myself. You want a, a sharp blade and you want to be able, watching where your fingers are positioned, to very carefully work your way through. And you can see that this blade, as new as it is, is probably ready to be switched because I'm starting to get some jagged pieces here. Old blades have a tendency to cause problems because they are going to snag and not easily move through the material. So they are far more dangerous. Uh, we'll switch back here. They are far, far more dangerous than a, a sharp blade because the sharp blade is gonna do what you're asking it to very easily. Um, now you can, when you get a foam head, if you're gonna do the Zordon build as I've, uh, I've done it here, if you want to get this head off, the first part of it that I did was I marked or all the way around it with a marker so that I knew exactly what I was trying to, to get to. Now you could use one of these blades and carefully work your way around it and then keep slowly repeating that. And when the time comes, extend your blade just enough to pull down and separate it from uh, the two parts that you created. However, um, I went a little more barbaric with the way that I removed this head and I'll we'll go ahead and show you that clip and then I'll explain myself afterwards. All right. All right. So here it is, Victoria. I, I just, I, I think, I'm not sure if I did it right off the bat, but I ended up going with the saw. I have a hand saw that was the perfect size for this and it made an enormous mess. Um, <laughs> however, it made very short work of, of the head and I was able to remove the face. And uh, if, you, if you're doing this in your backyard or your front yard, maybe alert your neighbors to the fact that you are, um, you're doing this so that they don't wonder what is wrong with you. <laughs> yes, yeah, sawing a face off a mannequin totally normal, right? might raise some eyebrows. Uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, like, listen, whatever you're doing in your hobby, as long as it brings you joy and doesn't hurt anybody, I say go for it. But uh, yeah, your neighbors, your parents, your, your spouse, your significant others may very well have questions for you if you're doing this in the middle of the living room, in the middle of the night, trying to figure out how you're going to get your Zordon to look great. Um, but that's just the first step. We're gonna get that face removed and then we're gonna be able to start to think about how we're going to then add on the features that are gonna take it away from just being a simple foam face to being something a lot more interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do a couple of different things. And again, the way that I do things is only to kind of show you a uh, potential path. Um, when it comes to this or really any kind of art, um, you should, you should, you know, be, if you're inspired and you want to divert away from the path that's been given to you, you should. I could tell you right now that if you don't like sculpting, you don't want to mess with the next sections where we are adding, uh, epoxies and clays and things onto the Zordon head. Um, you could skip that. You could paint just what you have using craft acrylic paint. And I think that you could create a very, very viable version of a Zordon head. I don't think that like, and there's a lot that you can do with paint. Like I've taken forms and added the, the highlights and the shadow and put some depth into it and making something a lot more three-dimensional by the use of this uh, paint to create the illusion of where that light is striking. Um, and so you can do a whole lot without having to get really deep into the sculptural parts of this. Okay. So how inspired by the 95 movie Zordon were you? Uh, I, I kind of was moving back and forth a little bit, but I think the 95 movie was the one that I was looking at it most because of the, the rectangular pieces. Um, I know that they had different, uh, they had different versions that went through. And I know that Zordon has kind of like, uh, has, has, there are each of the series obviously moved away or brought him back in or, or had different things that they were doing with the character, but I was looking for, for at least for my Zordon, I wanted the most kind of classic feel that I could find. And, and that really struck a tone with me. I didn't put all the little crenellations and the bits over here that I could have. Um, 
And again, this was a, in total, Victoria, this was about a four hour build. Four hours, so, okay. Yeah. So I spent about four hours on what we have here. You could spend 12, you could spend 30. I mean, you could 40, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you could make the best Zordon diorama that has ever been created in the existence of all Zordon dioramas, but it depends on what you want to spend your hobby time on and, and what you're getting out of it. Uh, personally, I felt like this level of Zordon was, was what I was looking for. Um, I do think I'd like to go back in and we're going to do a little work here today, so I might do some of it, but I do think I'm going to take a couple of these pieces and continue them all the way around. And I think it also, what it does is it camouflages the um, the look of the, the cottage cheese bucket a little bit more. Um, yeah. And it's all about, because if I didn't say that and I had this set up correctly, I don't know that many people are immediately going to say, oh, you took some cottage cheese buckets and you made a Zordon. Um, they're going to see the Zordon and they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, so people want to kind of see what you're, you're putting out there. Is, so you have a lot of freedom in, in the materials that you use. Um, but the 95 Zordon, yeah, I'd say that's about right. <laughs> All right. So now that we've cut the face off of the mm -hmm. mannequin. Yeah, so uh, now that we've looked like complete psychopaths, what are we doing next? <laughs> yeah, what are we doing next? You said, you mentioned in the next clip, um, we're sculpting. Yeah, so um, I believe that's correct. I think we're, the next clip is gonna show us working slowly to start to build on facial expressions that are gonna help to um, give us the version of Zordon that we wanna use. And again, as I've said, you can use a piece of paper. I Again, hit me up on social medias and I will get you set up with uh, some paper craft methods that you can use with this that would save you the pain of sculpture because if you just got the materials that I put within that Amazon listing, or if you went out and kind of pieced it all together with, with things that you find, if you do that, the, the, the most crucial part of that is the two. This was a little hard to find. I did have one that I gave to you all on Amazon. And again, I'm not like sponsored by Amazon here. I just wanted to make sure that these were easily accessible to as many people as possible. Um, if you're overseas or you're looking for something else, I'm sure that there are gonna be other options. I will personally help you kind of like find those. But this is an acrylic flower vase and the top is not open. It is actually a closed vase. I've turned it upside down and I've inserted the face into it. And then we've used our foam to create a plug so that when it comes down, it fits perfectly over that base. And in doing that, what it's going to allow us to do is to uh, hold all these parts together, but also to re-enter into the space if we need to, to change the batteries out for the light that we're inserting later on. Now, when we take that face, okay, um, you have to be aware of the diameter of the tube. So before you start sculpting on it or painting it or spending a lot of time doing detail work, whatever Zordon tube, acrylic tube you're using, I suggest that you dry fit it. So put it into that space, make sure that it's snug enough to be able to held, be held correctly. You can always glue your face in if it's a little small, but if it's too large, you've got a problem, especially if you're adding more material to it, right, Victoria? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. What I would highly recommend doing is, is dry fitting it in, pulling it back out, and then starting your work. Um, if we're ready, uh, I think Desiree is able to take us to this next clip and we can kind of talk through it. Okay, so here we are. And now I'm gonna talk while we're watching this a little bit about the material that I'm using. This is an epoxy uh, clay. It is uh, it's something, it's called epoxy sculpt is what I'm specifically using, uh, but you can find different versions of this uh, all over the place. You don't need to use this. If you find air dry clay at a craft store, you can use that. Uh, the reason that I use epoxy sculpt is that it is a two part uh, material that when you put it together, there's a chemical reaction. And that chemical reaction, when it's done, makes it rock hard. I mean, you couldn't hit it with a hammer and necessarily break it if you wanted to. Um, I find that the quality of the sculpting material, while it's still um, pliable, is very attractive. And it's, 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 something that's used heavily in the hobby world. There are versions of this that are known as green stuff, perhaps you've heard. Um, and 
it allows you to uh, to really kind of build very durable structures and to sculpt like you were working with a traditional clay. But when it's complete, it is very stable, very strong. You can sand it. You can you can really put it through some punishment to get a really smooth surface. Whereas some different types of clay, well, all clay is very very different. So depending on the type of clay that you get or you use, you might find that there are widely widely variant types of clay how they dry where do they break do they crumble is it you know is it something that i can get a good smooth surface on how does it take water it's so variable um, i like using epoxy salt and that's what i'm using here while using this product it's always recommended that you wear gloves and that you do so in a, a space with some ventilation because it is toxic um, it is not so toxic that it would be dangerous to you to use, but it is still a product that you do need to read your warnings on. You can check out the material listings online if you're that interested. I recommend just being very careful and not allowing your skin to be in contact with it for any extended period of time. Okay, that's good to know. Yes. So what do you have, because I, I, I'm i watching this video and like you just put in those those wrinkles with like, just with no aplomb, you just off they go. <laughs> what are some tips that you would have for a beginner sculptor for when they're attempting to create dimension on something like this? Yeah, so the first thing that I would say is don't try to do everything at once. Um, sculpting is about layers. And just like when you're drawing a picture, you might start out with the face, you might draw an oval, and then you would add the eyes and the nose and the mouth, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing with sculpture, only you're dealing with three-dimensional shapes and forms. So I would say build up slowly and know that it's much easier to add material than to necessarily take away material. Um, there are two different types of sculptors. There is subtractive and additive. Um, there, well, there's a lot of different types of sculptures or sculptors out there, but uh, specifically, in my opinion, it breaks down to do you prefer to remove material or do you prefer, prefer to add material? And I am certainly an additive sculptor most of the time, but I do use subtractive sculpting when necessary. The first thing that I would do is add small bits and balls of clay to begin to build up the major forms, ridges on the forehead, around the eyes, on the nose, the lips, the chin. And, and here specifically, I'm trying to impart some of the age of Zordon because, you know, wise old floating head, let's make sure that he has the appropriate facial features, right? Mm -hmm. And so in, in starting that, I, I kind of work slowly by adding those layers and then building up. When it comes to uh, using tools, Really, anything that you find can be a sculpture tool. Um, I've used paper clips. I've used the back of paint brushes um, to try to create some sort of indentation. I've used uh, traditional sculpting tools. But again, it, 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 you get into the situation where you, you don't have to spend money to do these things. And I think that that is often part of the fallacy of the hobby is that you have to have the perfect set of paint. You have to have the right brush. You have to have um, all of this material to be able to do this thing in this exact way. And if you don't do it in this exact way and match the box art, you have failed. Um, for me, I feel like my hobby journey has been certainly trying to break down the barriers around that and trying to find either new ways to do things or to kind of, um, you know, to, to, to preach the word of use what you have, hone your skills first, and then find them, find the tools and the materials that work best for you. Right, and that's something that Terry talks about in her painting streams all the time, yeah. is using what you have at home, use what you've got access to, um, because you, you don't need to go out and spend copious amounts of money on fancy tools and materials when you can just use what you've got lying around you. So true, yeah. Uh, Terry's a dear friend and I absolutely am so happy that uh, she was able to kind of help bring me into the community a little bit more fully. But I, I will say that um, it, it, it really can 
be intimidating for new painters. And I, I, I want to remove that. So if we're going too fast here, or if I'm talking about uh, things that I just take for granted, right? Like mm -hmm. you'd said, like sculpting very quickly. You don't have to be quick with this. Take your time and do what looks good to you. Your Zordon, I hope, doesn't look like my Zordon. I hope your, your Zordon looks like your Zordon. And what I'm hoping to do is give you the materials and the information that you need to experiment with the, the materials and make something that is your own. Uh, maybe you have a different era of Zordon that you want to replicate. Maybe you want to make a dice tower. Maybe you want to figure out a way to expand the model and, and do more with it or add more LEDs or any of these things. I mean, it's all about experimentation and enjoying your time building the thing. I think we so often get kind of hung up on the idea of like, well, it's done. I just want to get it done, right? But trying to get it finished is the journey, right? And that is why you're doing this because you like painting, because you like building stuff. And when you're, when you're enjoying it, you've already succeeded. It doesn't matter if the final product is hot garbage. It doesn't <laughs> matter at all, because if you had a good time doing it, you have something to be proud of at the end of the day, regardless. Exactly. I concur wholeheartedly. Half of the projects that I do, I don't necessarily finish, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people, but I have fun doing what it is that I do. I've got some cross stitch right next to me. Actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I, I, I love cross stitch. I am not good yet. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time with it, but it is one of those, one of those skills that I watch people who are good at it. And it's like much like this, right? You watch as people um, have progressed through their journey and you immediately the instinct and it's completely human is to kind of say, well, where am I at with it? Right? Mm -hmm. um, and and or I could never do that. And I've learned that that is you, that if you're able to train yourself to do one thing, the first thing is, is remove that barrier because you're the one who's setting it. Nobody else is right. Mm -hmm. If you want to cross stitch, learn how to cross stitch. If you want to know how to do sculpture, pick it up and start doing it. It's, it's, it's all about, it's all about putting the time in. And, and I, I'm not even saying that some people aren't going to immediately be better than other people or that you're, you're, it, it's all about the comparison. And I think we are really, as, as hobbyists, we're often put in a situation where we're shown, you know, the Rembrandt of something, you know, it could be like, I, I, I watch a lot of hobby streams and I watch a lot of people who are extremely, extremely skilled, more talented than I am. And I enjoy watching them because I learn things, but at the same time, it's a, it's a trick of your own mind to put yourself in a position where you are only comparing yourself to somebody else's work, right? Yep. It's, you know, it's this, um, I'm into powerlifting. So um, mm. it's, it's something that we talk about in powerlifting is it's like 80% mind. Um, it's, and it's like that for any hobby or anything you want. 80% of it is in here mm. because it, it's, it's in here that tells you whether or not you can do something or you can't do something. Agree so um, much. I like I, I power lifting is one of those things. It's you. It, it shows the human willpower more clearly than it does the human strength. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. One hundred percent. It's it's all in here. It's what um it's what you are willing to to do um and how you're willing to be confident in what you're doing and enjoying the process. Because you don't get good at powerlifting if you don't enjoy the process. Yeah. Just the same as you're not going to get good at sculpting if you don't enjoy the process. No, and I wouldn't, I would like, it's not for everybody. And that's kind of why uh, with this project, um, I specifically wanted to offer people some alternatives. So if you really do want to avoid that, you could draw your own Zordon head. You could paint your own Zordon head. You can go into Photoshop if you have some digital skills and you can do some really great stuff. You could take your own face put it through Photoshop, print it out, cut your face out, and you could be Zordon. Like, there are no limitations here. It's really what you choose to do and how you want to use the materials and this very rough outline that I'm giving you right now. So, where were we on our outline, Victoria? We were on, we just sculpted the face. Mm -hmm. So, now what? What do we do now that we have a face, we have a Zordon face mm -hmm. that can 
not painted yet. So do we paint it next or? Oh, well. Okay. So let's let's go back to the the, the idea of how these LEDs are going to tie in with what Ooh. we're doing. And I've got sorry, uh, we got a lot happening around here. Uh, <laughs> I've got some of these foam pieces too. I do have that uh, original piece here. So I'm going to walk through some of the ways that you can do this, just so that people know the materials that are available to them. Um, okay. Now that uh, I'm going to switch over to my overhead. Oh. We've got, uh, that's frozen a little bit. Let me see if I can get back to it and see if it's going to work. There we yeah. go. Okay, we'll just do this one. Uh, so look, I've got this uh, LED light, okay? And this particular light is again on that Amazon wish list if you are looking to just buy exactly what I recommend. Uh, the reason that I bought this is because it has uh, adequate battery power and it can be sealed up. It is the right size and diameter for what we need and it has a remote control. Ooh. So what this is gonna do for us is that once the uh, light is in place on the Zordon, we're easily able to turn it on. You're gonna get some weird flashing here because of the camera overhead. But uh, if you wanted to change it up and change the color of the Zordon, you certainly could do that, but it's got a blue light. And the one that I've offered up here is uh, multicolor. Uh, so you can get that blue light and it is going to be able to be battery operated. It's got three LED nodes, which are fairly strong and are giving us a pretty pretty solid uh, look here. Now, uh, you can find anything that works. There is no real right answer here as to what LED you're gonna use. If you want to run the cabling, you can certainly make it so that you can plug your Zordon in. Uh, all you have to do is just be prepared to, to run a cable out of the back of it and then plug it into a wall. I'm going to switch back here. And then so, it's like a lava lamp. Yeah, it is. It's very much like a lava lamp, um, which I guess is what Zordon is, right? Um, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I've got it in set here. You can see more or less there where I've got the light placed in. And what I did was I took the circular base that I created out of our foam. Oh, there we go. Our circular base that was created out of the foam. Uh, and I then traced out the size of our light into the center of it, okay? And then once that was done, I cut that shape out very carefully, sanded everything up and inset that into this space. Okay. Um, yeah, so do we wanna to go to that clip and I can, I can show you directly? Kind of some of that process yeah let's let's take a look at how that works um so again it's all about using uh whatever light you can find this is just the way that i've done it but the idea here is to inset it into that main space so that it hides the light a little bit more you don't necessarily need to do that you could show the light you could just hot glue this light directly onto a piece of treated foam Remember, we talked about putting a coat of glue down mm -hmm. to protect it. But if you if you protect it, then you can just put some hot glue on it. You can set that light down. You don't need to inset it. But since I wanted to go a little bit further and hide the light a little bit more, and then I had this special ringed uh, piece that I installed on the top, um, I did all of that just to give it a little bit more um, a little bit more detail. And you could go about this any way that you choose. However, uh, I, would, I would recommend just experimenting and finding out what works best. For me, the, 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 the remote is sort of non-negotiable as far as parts that I would, I would go for, but you don't wanna have to open this up every single time you wanna turn it on. You don't wanna have to fiddle with it. So having a good battery power and having that remote is really a, a huge help. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. And then I do like the fact that there's no cord um, so you can place it wherever and it doesn't need to be next to an outlet. Yeah, yeah. Because I so, don't know about you, outlets are a precious commodity in my house. Oh, they are. And then also when you're in a game space and like if you were going to set this Zordon up next to the table to try to create a nice environment for you to play Heroes of the Grid, if you were going to do all that uh, and then there's a, a cable, because I, I don't know how everybody else plays, but I'm all the way around the table all the time and, and like people are moving around. So... Um, the last thing you want to do is create a giant trip hazard in the middle of your play space. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that wouldn't be fun, you know, face no. first. Oh. There goes Squat and Babu. Woo. Yeah. So, what can I uh, talk about next? We, we we are now at the point where we've kind of assembled parts of this, and I think we're getting pretty close to the painting, right? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we are absolutely going to be talking about the painting a little bit more. However, we currently are putting the, the, the pieces of this together. You can see that I'm using hot glue. Um, the hot glue, again, is something that you want to use uh, cautiously. It can burn you and you can create blisters on your hands very easily. If you've never worked with hot glue before, um, I highly recommend that you put a, uh, some sort of mat down that is going to protect whatever surface you're working on. Um, there's nothing worse than ruining a coffee table or a dining table or something that you and your family might be using uh, because you are doing a crafting project. It's a really quick way to make somebody in your household super angry. <laughs> um, so just be careful and also protect yourself. Um, if, uh, if wearing gloves helps you, you can certainly wear gloves while you're working on some of this. If you're, I mean, uh, depending on how young you are, you may need to get uh, some, some parental assistance in building this, which is absolutely acceptable. Um, there's no shame in it at all. Uh, definitely ask for help. Uh, it's, it's, not super, um, it's not super safe to just trust that the hot glue is not going to burn you, because if you've ever used hot glue, it's going to probably burn you. Um, yep. Yeah. So Those strings too. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it does. It has strings, but it is a very strong, reliable, quick material that can be used to do a lot of this assembly for us. Now, I'm going to go, Victoria, to one of our overheads again. No, not okay. this one. You I think the in. video is still playing still? slightly. Sure. Uh, we'll wait for it to come back, and then I'll talk a little bit about our yeah. uh, our acrylic tube. So, so I just have a quick question. What made you think, you know what? I'm going to use a plastic cup. Yeah, yeah. So I was really kind of, I was certain that I knew how I was going to do this until I started to do it. And then when I started working on the project and I had all these different materials in front of me, I started to dry fit stuff together. And I the, the cottage cheese and all the little parts that I put around it were a result of the planning stage at that first first two steps or so, where I was kind of looking at the materials that I have and seeing what I wanted my final form and my silhouette to look like. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was experimenting and I was moving things in and out. And um, when we come back from the clip, I'll show you a few other options that I had that I didn't go with. Um, things that I chose that could easily work to make a great Zordon, perhaps even better than this one, but I just chose to move away from that and use the materials that I chose to use, either because there was a specific lip. Um, because when we look at things, Victoria, I think it's like, yeah, we're looking at a cup and it's clearly a cup. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you turn it upside down and you slice it in half and you put it up against something else and then everything gets painted the same color and then you dry brush over it, kind of bring that texture out, all of a sudden it stops being a cup and it starts becoming a piece of some sort of high technology, weird space, uh, like exploration equipment that has all these different ridges and angles to them. And by tying it all together with other parts, we create a different perception of it, right? Mm -hmm. So right now in the clip, uh, we're just taking, I know I'm a, there's a little bit of a delay for me for where I'm talking everyone. Sorry about that, but I am watching on Twitch and there's like that 15 seconds, but uh, we're just as you're cutting out the foam, um, the triangular pieces for yeah. the Zordon uh, casing. Uh, and and I noticed you're, you're sanding it. Uh, is that sandpaper that you're sanding that on? Yeah, so I set down a piece of sandpaper and all I was doing with that was trying to smooth out the rough edges of the foam itself. Now you can get a pretty good clean cut for it. However, if I'm going to put something uh, onto a, a part of a model that's going to be front facing, 
Um, I like to make it as 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 uh, smooth as possible if that's the look I'm going for. Now, if Zordon was more kind of post-apocalyptic and beaten up, maybe I would go in and rough it up. But with the sandpaper, I just set it onto a flat uh, surface, and then I very smoothly worked the material along it. And um, I also did the same for the circle that I used for the interior and all the other parts, just to make sure that everything had a good smooth finish. Nice. And if you take a couple of different grits of sandpaper, it's always best to go rough and then work your way down to the smoothest grit of, of sandpaper that you have. Okay. And what did you use um, for the columns? So those are all containers from different things that I've collected. Most of them are household parts. Okay. Um, so for instance, the, the little tubes on the end are the caps of different cleaning products. And so if you kind of go through a junk drawer or if you like, for me, what I do is I just kind of collect pieces of things. Um, so if I see something that has an interesting shape to it, I will, um, I'll start to kind of keep it around. Is it okay if I go to an overhead at this point? Yeah, you can, we just swapped over. Oh, okay, so let me, let me jump over here. And so like, this is a, a cap off of a, a, one of those, um, uh, if it's you're, like if you're, glue or something. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a cap um, that I collected. And so I just like the shape of it, but if I added parts to it and then put like a wire out of the top, it really quickly becomes like an antenna uh, base. And mm -hmm. so things like that can easily become part of, of your hobby process. So like if I were to set that there and glue that in and then paint it, I don't think anybody would question whether or not that was meant to be a part of the model, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's and fun. So, yeah. Uh, just having that eye of I mean, kind of that magpie like qualities is what you're <laughs> saying is you kind of need um, just keep an eye out for interesting shapes, grab them, you know, get a big tote, keep everything there. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it, it can quickly descend into hoarding, so be careful. <laughs> but I would say just, you know, keep an eye on small pieces that specifically are going to help you with the projects that you have on your table. And when the time comes, I, I find a lot of things at dollar stores and thrift stores, old toys. If you start to collect old toys, if you either have children or brothers and sisters and siblings that uh, perhaps are um, are, are, are getting too old for certain toys, you can take those toys apart and you can get some really great parts that you can then incorporate into things like this. Now, what I'm showing you right now is the acrylic base that I used for the base. And it is, in my mind, the perfect shape, size, and uh, quality that is needed for this project. However, uh, there are other ways that you can do this. I am certain that you could find material like this uh, one of the ways that you might be able to kind of sidestep the need to buy this um, is to get an old two liter bottle of soda and cut the top and the bottom off and then use that circular, or I'm sorry, that cylinder that is the central part of the container to build around that. Now, I think that that plastic would be considerably weaker than this, so you would have to be careful, but it's an easy way to, to cut your cost down very quickly. I had also uh, considered using this. Uh, this was a cashew tin, and it's the kind of thing that you get for like a, I don't know, it, it, there are so many different, like popcorn comes in this sort of a, a container. Coffee. Uh, coffee is certainly one of them. And uh, you can take these, uh, you can cut them because it's cardboard. Again, you would take your knife and just work your way around. I would measure and mark everything that you do. But once you do that, you can then start to kind of cut into this. You would have two parts. You can even use the lid to help create some more stability by gluing that back into place. And then if you had two parts of this, this could easily, this coffee container, could become the top and the bottom of Zordon's um, containment tube very easily. I'm gonna come back over here. All right. Um, so. We've gotten to the point where we have assembled the majority of the model. We've, we've kind of shaped everything out. We've sanded things down. We've prepared 
all of these triangular pieces that are going to create a little bit of texture. Again, for my build, I want to add more of these all the way around, uh, build a little more texture out, but that's just kind of where we are right now. Um, mm -hmm. The next step is to go ahead and break out some paints and to start to bring in a little bit of color. Is that correct? Is that our next clip is going to be painting the face? Okay. Okay, outstanding. Thank you again for all the support out there. We've got some amazing tech wizardry happening right now as Desiree <laughs> leads us through. Um, so we're dealing with the base and the face. And how I did that was I, I, I completed all of the assembly into three major parts, which would be the tube, the face, the top, and the bottom. So you have those three parts, right? Top, middle, bottom. And I kept them separate. And I'm gonna paint those in those three parts once they're fully assembled. Now, the first step to all of this is to put down a good prime coat. And this is an opportunity for you to build up stability for your model, as well as to add a good base that you can then paint further off of. Um, now the face, once all of that epoxy clay was completely dry, I put a full coat of blue down and I had mixed it up using a little bit of just, this is the cheapest acrylic paint that you can get at any art store. Mm -hmm. The brand is Sargent, um, but I, I promise you, you can find this anywhere from like a, a Walmart to a uh, Michaels or a, just depending on what part of the world you're in, you're gonna be able to find this you'll probably even be able to find it at a some sort of dollar bargain type store yeah i've definitely gotten acrylic paints like that at dollar stores right and i mean like it's just so inexpensive you can get a wide variety um don't be afraid to mix these up it is acrylic paint the pigment inside of it you can create custom colors um, but for the most part for this project you're going to need a couple of colors uh you can use old like i've used old house paint to like put a coat of paint down it is a latex based paint so it's a little thicker and can be gummier, but you can use any of this to create viable results for whatever diorama or terrain or hobby piece that you might be working on. Um, all of these skills, Victoria, are the same thing that I use when I'm building uh, props for LARPing or if I'm doing something for a cosplay or if I'm doing something for um, just for a display. If I, if I want to make something that I want to put up onto a wall, you can use these techniques anywhere that you might have the need to try and build something either a prop or um, a costume piece or something like that having a good set of acrylic paints is going to serve you in so many different ways no matter what you're doing but i would highly recommend that you not fall into the trap of buying really expensive paint especially not for larger builds like this if you are currently painting your heroes of the grid models and um, you are breaking into like scale color paints and if you're using your really expensive uh, chimera whatever uh, paints you might be using even the citadel stuff all of those are very expensive for very small pots of paint i don't this isn't really the place to use a lot of that uh, if you're doing detail work absolutely um, by all means but i would just be cautious about the material that you're using because you have to cover a very large surface mm -hmm. it's not a one-to-one -one thing it's not like oh i'm painting a face so let me get my really expensive hobby paint and start using that the same way that i would on a ranger um mm -hmm. yeah yeah well so you want to look at scale mm -hmm. and how much of the material you're going to need like i used a um i used a healthy amount of acrylic paint to do the face and so uh you know, that would have probably taken up an entire little bottle of Citadel, you know, and these are, this is, if you get it the right place, like 60 cents American, probably, uh, this is like $8 and 50 cents. So yeah. there's a huge difference there in, in the kind of, um, investment. And some of these products I absolutely recommend using on some of these larger larger things uh but you just use it really sparingly and only where you really need to um if you like using washes and wash techniques and you don't want to mix up your own washes th there's an argument that can be made for that but the great thing about acrylic paint much like with the glue is that it is a water-based product that is by the name of it water soluble so you're able to take this pour it into a little cup add some water 
and use it as a wash. Now, it's not as easy as all of that when it comes to trying to keep the adhesion of the paint. So as you start to thin down your acrylic, the medium, because that all acrylic paint has three major components. There's a, uh, there's a mixer medium. So you have some sort of medium that's gonna kind of transfer the pigment, which is one of the other ones. And then a, the, the binder, it, it's gonna help for the adhesion. So you've got all these things that work together but once you start to water it down, it disperses that. So you don't get the same kind of adhesion that you would for, for normal paint, right? Right. Um, am I moving too fast, Victoria? Or do you no, that... you're moving at a great speed. We've got about 25 minutes left. So no, this is perfect. Yeah, let's, let's move over to our painting clip and I'll keep talking to you about kind of how I work with paint, but let's go ahead and watch how we applied it to our Zordon. Um, so you can, um, you can really increase your, um, the style of Zordon that you're building using just paint. So if you want to paint these wrinkles into the face, if you want to paint all these little indentations and create a different look, uh, paint is a viable way to do that. Uh, you can definitely build those illusions of light and shadow with just paint. Now, what I did, um, is I used the cheap acrylic paint, right? And I used a blue, but I also had some white and I had some black. This is not, um, this is the simplest way that I can, I can kind of give this to you. Typically, when I'm painting shadow, I will want to use a darker tone of whatever color or hue I'm using, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would use a darker blue or maybe put a little purple into the blue to bring that into a darker tone. However, since we're trying to keep things really simple, a little bit of a black with this blue is going to do just fine. And then a little bit of white with this blue is going to do fine to give us a highlight. We then have shadow, our base, and our uh, highlight, right? Okay, yeah. It's super simple. And so when you do that, though, you're desaturating the color. Because when you add white or black to anything, you're taking the pigment and you're, you're dulling it down. This is a really intense blue. And I chose it because it had kind of the baseline Zordon color that I wanted to use. And I was able to take it and then bring it into what I felt like was a, an appropriate tone by adding the white and black. So I kind of counted on the properties of my two primary tones to change the hue of the blue, right? Um, and, and it's as simple as that. You can, you can get as deep into the painting part of this as you like. If you wanna make a like masterwork painted face, this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, for the rest of the model, I based everything in a black and I thinned the black down a little bit and I actually added a little, uh, I don't think I did it through the whole thing, but I did add a little bit of a PVA glue, which allows to kind of form a, a very solid uh, base that gives it stability and protects the foam underneath and that prevents any sort of spraying or painting that we might do in the future. Um, once that black was completely dry, I then used a product that is a metallic gold. This is called, um, this is from Triangle Crafts and it is called Sophisticated Finishes. Um, it is not an inexpensive material. It's a, a metallic surfacer, it's a gold color, um, but it was a large bottle and I don't think I paid an, an insane amount of money for this. I think it was probably $8. So I was able to get a fairly good tube of this and I barely used a quarter of it on this project, but you could find other versions of this or you can mix up, um, you know, golds and yellows and other orange colors and, and various shades of brown even and kind of build the illusion of that metal using regular paint. For this, it was simply paint it entirely black and then use a little bit of a gold craft paint to then dry brush across the entire surface and kind of build that up so that we were able to create a metallic uh, finish, right? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of got that weathered metallic look to it, which I really enjoy. Yeah, and, and if you could add lighter colors if you have other metallic colors so if you mix this with a, a really bright silver paint you could then make some really nice highlights that you can then use and dry brush and just put a little less on and really look at the areas where the light would be striking most 
and, and working across those areas. And I'm using just fat, old, cheap craft brushes. I'm not using anything really fancy. I mean, I get packs of these for um, pennies a piece uh, from either a craft store or at the dollar store, you can find these. Um, again, use the material that works best for you. If you find brushes that you really like and you wanna spend a bunch of money on it, by all means, just take care of your brushes. But when I'm working across it, I'm just doing like light dry brushing and pulling things. And I'm just working across the whole surface. And I'm doing that in three sections. So I'm not gonna be putting gold onto that tube while I'm working on it. Cause I don't want anything to hit the acrylic tube. I want that to be clean. Right. Yeah, so you can do that. And then you could add as many layers to go higher and higher on your highlight. And you can really smooth this out. My, my Zordon's seen better days as far as like a little bit of tarnish, a little dingy. Um, however, if you really wanted to smooth it out, you would be able to do that fairly easily. Okay. Yeah, and we just finished up the uh, the clip. We just oh, watched great. you paint all that and put that together. So then now, well, like, once everything's painted, it's dried, it's time to assemble, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, assembly is kind of the last part of this, really. Um, there are some other things that you can do to add details, but the key component here is to put the pieces together in a way that are going to allow you to be accessible when you are trying to get back to that LED light that's on the inside here. Um, so while this is removable, I can twist this and pull the Zordon off. I don't have to do it very often. I'm not gonna do it here, but I've glued the, uh, the circular piece with the light onto the rest of this base. This is now three parts. And I'm going to insert the face, the Zordon head, into the um, into our tube. Let me see if I have some of this material here in front of me. Hold on just one moment, Victoria. All right, I am holding. Okay. Thank uh, you very much, Desiree. Well, let's go ahead and go to that clip and then I'll come back and then we'll talk a little bit about the material that I used to get it a holographic texture on the inside of the tube. Okay, yes, I was wondering about that and what you were using. So is that just like cellophane that you would use to like wrap a gift basket with? Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Um, I was a little picky about the cellophane that I found. I was looking for something that had a really reflective quality to it. Um, and I wanted that sort of vapor wave pink and purple color. Um, and so you can find a variety of this. And, and since we're getting closer and closer to the holidays, um, we are, you're probably gonna be able to find a lot more of this in the stores just right at, at your fingertips. Um, Find whatever works best for you, but you do want something that is transparent and that uh, for me, it was also about the right thickness. Uh, the, the stuff that I finally found worked really well and I crumpled it up, rolled it into a really tight ball and then unrolled it. And then once that happened, I was able to kind of inset it into the tube. Okay. Yeah, so we're looking, we're watching that in the clip right now. Um, and so I'm seeing exactly what you mean by that. And yet that's really fun. And I like how it reflects the light from underneath um, and kind of creates, like you said, that holographic Zordon presence. It, it diffuses, you can do without it. Like, again, this is one of those stages that you could skip if you wanted to save a little bit of money. But the idea of the sculpted face, it's a little uh, too tangible. Uh, if you don't do the cellophane side of things. And I found that when I was testing out different ways to not possibly do this, Victoria, I found that the um, the cellophane helped to diffuse it and kind of spread it out a little bit. So it didn't feel like it was perfectly solid because the light mm. would catch in certain ways. You get a little bit of a reflection. Um, I have way too many lights on in here to really give you the full effect of the head. But when you're in a regular room that isn't being blasted with studio lights, I promise you that you're going to find that this thing glows um, really brightly. And much like a, a lava lamp, you're able to use it for um, either, you know, whatever sort of environmental scene you want to set for your game. But it's a lot of fun. 
Yeah. This is this is a ton of fun. So that that was that was the last clip, right, Desiree? Um, yeah. So that I think this looks amazing. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your process and doing this for us. Yeah, absolutely. I had a great time doing it. And I know that there are a lot of folks out there in the community that are going to have some questions. I don't want anyone to hesitate reaching out to me directly. I'm happy to help. And most importantly, if you could do me a very big favor, if you do build one of these on your own, please post it on social media, tag the Heroes of the Grid, and make sure that everyone kind of sees that it is tied specifically. Play Renegade and everyone else, I hope that we can kind of get this all tied together so that we're able to kind of keep track of what people are doing. I really want to see what other people can do with this. Yeah, so do I. So yeah, if you are a member of our Facebook group or if you are not, you should join it because um, it's a great group. It is so welcoming and it is one of the most inclusive and welcoming communities I'm a part of. Um, but yeah, come come there because um, uh, Noxweiler is is a member um, and show it off. We want to see it. Um, Absolutely. If anyone have any questions, about this process or about ways maybe you could switch things up or maybe use different types of materials, anyone. And if you do, just drop that in chat. If you can, put the word question in capitals at the beginning so it's easy for me to spot it. And, and uh, yeah, so, cause I love crafting. Mm -hmm. I actually just got, <laughs> So I, I do a lot of like needlework stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I just got a whole slew of bamboo knitting needles and I'm really oh, wow. excited to get started for all the holiday stuff. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has never decorated their house for the holidays in their life. Wow. So I am making a whole bunch of holiday decorations for them. How sweet. That's amazing. <laughs> Here you go. Um, so what would you suggest for very beginner makers to start off? Um, so if you, if you feel too intimidated by this, uh, if you feel like this is too much, what I recommend doing is maybe starting at just a portion of it and finding something that maybe you could use within either your gaming space or maybe a display for your models that you might have. So you could just take one of the tops of these and you can make a nice little platform that you yeah. could use to set a couple of models on in a kind of like a Power Ranger type, uh, some sort of structure that would actually make you uh, feel like you were displaying your models maybe in a little bit of a better way. All you would need really are a couple of pieces of foam. Again, you can just get this. You could just use this and make rocks. I mean, if you want to go really simple, make a make a boulder that has uh, really cool crags in it, or you could even sculpt something a little bit in there. And then you can have your models uh, to display. You just kind of measure out where they are. Here, I'm gonna go down to the table here. So you can measure out kind of like what the size of the model was and you know figure out that, okay, well that model's gonna sit there. And then you can stack these together so that then you could put your other models around it and make a cool little stepped display that would allow you to have uh, some place to kind of show them off a little bit more. Oh, Desiree, do you have the Facebook group link handy? Someone's asking for that link. <laughs> yeah, Desiree will get that in chat for you. Uh, speaking of uh, crafting though, I have, a, um, I have an embroidery machine that I've been trying to figure out for about half a year now. I've not really spent a whole lot of time with it because I'm an avid 3D printer as well. So it, okay. I, find, I find such a parallel between the two things, taking digital shapes and then transferring them over. Mm -hmm. And for LARPing, I've got like tons of these like wizard robes and other things that I've been working on to try to, I, I would never be able to embroider an entire robe. I don't have the time. I, I appreciate That's the art. A it's a lot of work. And unfortunately I have to be somewhat uh, judicious about how I spend the time. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I was in a different world to be able to learn how to do that skill. But at the same time, these machines do a pretty good job of it. And so I've been slowly kind of working towards that. And just like anything, it's just an investment of time. So if you find that you are frustrated by something, uh, you know, step away from it, give it, a, give it a day or two, and then come back to it and try to break it down to the most core component 
that is uh, as, as simple as you can go. So I guess for this, it would be like building rocks or little pedestals and then maybe working your way back up to building a building or making fences. Um, mm -hmm. I know Heroes of the Grid is, is all a, a board game that's based in very con confined spaces, but th that circular board and all the other stuff that comes along with it, you could make some really great trays that you could use to put all your stuff back into or something really thematic, like you could replace your box with, oh, sorry, your box with um, something that was like a little more decorative so that it felt like you were you were on some sort of like science fiction type uh, structure and you could just kind of pull the box open and then have all of your gear in there. <laughs> when you talk about building boulders and stuff, I'm picturing like original Star Trek boulders, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Big aliens come in, grab them up and throw them around or what was like on Hercules and Xena. I mean, they probably use this foam to do that, to be honest. <laughs> probably. <Yeah. laughs> do we have any effect. other questions or are people no, pretty satisfied? Um, yeah, the, the other question was, would you use foam to make rocks or other type of beginner projects? Which uh, I think you answered. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Foam, foam, this is the starting point. Like if you want to learn how to do some of this stuff, just get some of this material and start having fun with it. And see what you can do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think that was it. So this is great. Um, I had a lot of fun. It, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I had a lot of fun watching you build this. I really enjoyed those clips because I, I love watching people create and make things. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next, we've got up. Oh, I don't have the schedule open. You know what? It's the reunion show, y'all. We have actual Power Rangers so much great stuff happening i was looking at the <laughs> schedule and i was blown away by what you guys put together so i'm very thankful that you were all able to have me in um i'm really excited to be a part of this community i want to thank everybody for how welcoming they've been and if you ever have any questions or you even if it's about miniature painting or about terrain and there's something that i can help you with please just reach out i'm i'm really accessible and uh, i just love being a part of communities that care about you know the 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 things that they love the most. And the Power Rangers community is definitely ravenous about how they support themselves and the product that they love. So let me know what I can do to help. Yeah, where can we find you on social media? Yeah, so all across all social media, I'm just at Eaten by Poshki, um, which I think it'll be linked below. But you can also find me on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv slash scabby rooster. I do a ton of hobby work there during the days. But uh, we also do a lot of LARPing and tabletop role playing. And you can kind of find me all over the place. So yeah, you've check been it out. playing a little bit with one of my very good friends, B Zelda, lately. Oh, yeah. yeah. B is great. Yeah. yeah. So we've been hanging out and uh, doing all kinds of fun stuff. So definitely find us. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. It's been a blast. Stick around because in half an hour, we've got the reunion. We've got so some exciting. really great people coming up. So thank you, everyone. Have a good one. And remember to play your games.